the numbers of the budget really accessible online to the general public so that any individual, if they're curious, and which any citizen should have that ability, any citizen should be able to hold their government accountable. Um, and that's really what we need, is we need accountability from our government. And they can do that uh, through Public Records Information Act, where they can actually request that type of information. Do you find that government is that open and transparent to the, to the Currently, people? Currently, no. It, it, it's very... Um, it's very restrictive, I think. You know, if you try to gain information through the Public Information Act, it can be a burdensome uh, project for, for an individual. Well, it costs you too, doesn't right. it? Exactly. Right. And, and that really shouldn't be the case. I mean, all this information should be readily ex accessible to the, gov to the citizens, and it should be free. Because um, we live in a, a well, representative democracy. And it that should not be expensive because these days we've got online media that they could put this stuff online for people to look at. I think the legislature has, in fact, given themselves a, gr a large ability to hide what they do. So, and there's two ways that they do that. They, ex they have exempted themselves from the public records law. I think the budgets that we see, we'll see top line items for entire departments, but we don't know how that's being spent. A lot of times, if they got an unpopular program or a program where they know they'll get criticized because it's a narrow special interest program, that just gets rolled into a budget for a particular department. Nobody knows what's in there, and so that's how they get those things through. And that's why those of us on the outside you know, have to say, only when I'm on the inside of these things am I going to know where this money's going. The other way that they hide things is that we have a very good open records law in Massachusetts that every, every municipality is, is required to follow, but the legislature has exempted themselves from that also. So when they go to negotiate these budgets or go to negotiate these types of laws, that's done behind closed doors. We saw that, for example, with the casino bill. Everyone's concerned, who's pushing this? Why is this such a priority? Well, we don't know because we don't know what conversations are having in there. We don't know who is influencing that conversation. And to get to what you were saying before, you know, we don't really know how much revenue casinos will bring into the state. We don't really know um, how many jobs it will create because we haven't had an independent study. There was a study done, however, the company that did the study works for the casinos. So that's not an independent study. So we actually don't know if these numbers are, are, are real, if they can actually be realized. Um, and part of the problem is too is that that was based that study was based on three casinos. Now you have the Senate bill, which is two casinos, but they're still using the same numbers from that that study. <laughs> well, if you changed the overall architect of the plan, how can you still project the same numbers? Because you've dropped the slots, you've dropped one of the casinos. I don't know. And, and as I actually has uh, had conversations before is, are uh, these actually, even if you do build a casino, are the jobs going to go to Massachusetts residents? Because I can't imagine there are many professional dealers in Massachusetts because we don't have any casinos. So they're actually going to have to bring in people from other states, you know, to at least initially staff the casino. So those jobs will not go to citizens of the Commonwealth. Well, casinos, I mean, getting on that topic, is not generally a really good business for a state. I mean, I th Massachusetts has been able to, our economic prosperity comes from bringing in jobs that, you know, where you have companies that sell products outside of the state. So that's money where if you've got a biotechnology company or, or something, a manufacturing company, we sell stuff in other parts of the country, other parts of the world, that brings money into Massachusetts. When you have a casino, that's going to, a, a business like that is going to take money from people that live here it's going to filter through the casino. Some amount of that money will stay here in terms of jobs for a few jobs for people that work in the casinos. But the owners of those casinos a lot of times are from out of state, but even more so, a lot of times they're even from overseas. I think the primary funders of, of, of some of these casino projects they're proposing are actually from Malaysia. So you're looking at, I think a casino uh, option is something that states that don't have other options go for. You know, you don't have an educated workforce, you don't have any manufacturing base, maybe you've got nothing else to do to educate, the, to uh, employ these people. Here in Massachusetts, we really should be looking at, you know, uh, technology for, and you know, green jobs for, for, for biotechnology, for these types of things, manufacturing, um, instead of an option like this. Right. And the other, the other thing is, is why now? Why, why the rush? to do casinos. The state legislature is doing nothing now. They've, what, nine days or so left in the legislative session, and they're focusing all on casinos. We still have an unemployment rate that's over 9% in the state. We have people out of work who need jobs, and a lot of them might be running out of unemployment benefits now, and, and that's going to you know, bring up a host of issues for a lot of them and potentially not being able to pay their mortgage or feed their children. 
But instead of actually tackling those issues, which are really important to the average day citizen, they're spending all their time on casinos. Why? Now, you see, government is big. You mentioned that um, the government works for the people. Well, it's supposed to. Does it? <laughs> I don't believe it works for the people in the state of Massachusetts. I think that um, the one-party rule that we actually have in Massachusetts has gone to the point where the government is actually serving the political uh, elite, you know, if, if you will. It's actually serving those members um, who are part of the machinery. Um, just look at the perks they get, like I said, driving, to, you know, getting paid to drive for work. The average citizen doesn't get that. Why should you? Well, when you ask if the government works for the people, I think one first question a voter has to look at is, who is funding my candidate? So you've got a senator, a representative comes to you and says, here are my priorities. Here's, you know, and they'll tell you their, their, prior, their priorities are your priorities. But then you say, well, who's paying for your campaign? And you'll look in there, and these are publicly available documents. There's, you, anyone can go online and see this. And you'll see that, oh, they're getting money from lobbyists. They're getting money from PACs. Those are the people that are really in control. And so what you have to look at is not what these legislators say their priorities actually are, but just see what have they really done, you know? Have they spent their time trying to solve these problems, like the the the, in, the uh, sales tax problem that's causing problems for small business, the, the the health insurance problems, the problems municipalities have, things like that? Have they focused their time on those things, or are they focusing their time on you know bills that benefit certain unions, bills that Building benefit the casinos, the casinos? you know? Um, and, and that's really where it gets down to is you know the politicians actually have found ways to get around you know, finding out who your donors are. I mean, that's what we reported in the Tribune with my opponent and his charity. His books don't have to be open. And so we don't know who's funding. Now, some, you know, um, great investigative work, some people have actually looked at other um, PACs or, or individuals to see where they donate, and they've noticed that they have donated to uh, Senator Bedour's, um Charity, you know, but again, it, it there the legislature has found ways to get around um, the open government. The, this idea that the government serves the people, they found ways to get around it and hide things from us, uh, and that needs to have some light shown on it so that we can all and see it, you know, in, in, in the light of day. And if you're elected, how open and transparent? Besides, as what I you said, pointed out? everything would be open and transparent. Um, I would put everything up on the internet, you know, and ideally. I would be able to, re, you know, videotape um, the meeting so that people could actually see actual recording um, instead of just actually typing up minutes and actually listing the participants. They'll be able to see it. Do you know um, if your opponent, uh, Senator Bedore, does that now? Not that I'm aware of. He does not do that now. Do you think that government needs to be reduced? And if so, can we, by reducing government, can we close the deficit? Ideally, government, you know, should be able to be reduced. Um, I, you know, one of the things that um, we should be able to do is actually fund a commission to actually look at where the government's waste, where the money's going, and if we actually have any redundancies in our or organizational structure. Um, are there two separate departments actually doing the same job? Um, look, the only growth industry that's occurred in Massachusetts in the past two years has been the government. So more and more people are being hired by the government but again, as we mentioned, our services are actually going, are being reduced. So if there's, the state's taking more money and more money than ever, they have more people working for the state, but yet our services are, are, are being reduced, well, what's going on there? I mean, I think the legislature this year had an opportunity to solve some of these problems and they really didn't focus on those. Uh, when, I mean, many people are seeing problems in their own town, you know, that seem like town problems, where the town itself is cutting services, the, your, your, your city may be cutting trash pickup, maybe cutting schools, things like, things of this kind, and maybe raising your property taxes. It looks like a local problem, but really what's happening is that there's a subsidy that comes from the state. They've reduced that on one side, the so-called local aid. On the other side, a lot of these towns are hit with um, increases in the cost of health insurance for their employees. And so they're squeezed on both sides. The towns generally don't have any ability now to reduce the costs for the health insurance for, for, for municipal employees. The legislature had an opportunity this year both to restore or at least level fund local aid, and there was also an opportunity for them to reform the health insurance laws so that municipalities had an ability to address this increasing health insurance cost for their employees. But they refused to do both of those things. Right, they did neither. And, and that's just it, I mean, to bring it to Methuen is, you know, Methuen has suspended yard waste pickup for August and September. They're going to re resume in October. 
Um, you know, they've just laid off a, a number of teachers, um, and they're going to raise our taxes. So why? I mean, it, you know, obviously the cuts in local aid have really hurt, you know, Methuen and a lot of the other municipalities. And also, too, a lot of these towns are actually waiting. I mean, the, the way the budgetary season's set up, they don't know how much money they're going to be getting from the state until after they need to form their budgets. Um, and so one of the things that I would like to see is a requirement from the state to actually tell each city and town what they're actually going to get in local aid before the city and town needs to plan their budget um, so that the city and town can actually make real decisions based on a, a, an actual number as opposed to a guess which may or may not be true. And real quickly, what about uh, pension, pension and, and union reform? Uh, well, in terms of pension, um, it's a system that certainly needs to be overhauled. I mean, I think that's one of the major expenses that the state is actually facing at the moment. Um, in terms of elected officials, I don't see a need for elected officials to actually receive a pension. Uh, elected officials are there to be a public servant. They're there to actually do the will of the people. Uh, what's happened is a lot of them have become fat cats. A lot of them are actually there and just to collect that pension. Um, you know, and there also should be reforms put into place, whereas if you actually are, you know, necessarily convicted of a crime, um, that you don't get your pension. And if you're actually currently indicted for a crime, that your pension should be actually suspended. Well, we just saw exactly. uh, in the paper with the fire, yeah, the we, fire yeah, that's department. Really well, that, voters, I think. You know, our current, well, our previous Speaker of the House just had his pension reinstated. He's under indictment for corruption, and yet now he's able to collect his pension. If he wasn't properly serving the people, then he should forfeit his pension. I, think I agree, that's and, so, and that's why I think that if you're convicted, your, your pension should absolutely be forfeited. But if you're under indictment, there's no reason why your pension can't be suspended, you know, pending the outcome of, uh, of your trial. You know, if, if it comes out that you're exonerated, then you can get all the back pay, you know, pay of your pension or whatever. But if you're found, you know, guilty, you've lost that because obviously you were not looking out for the best interest of the people and therefore you should not be rewarded for the service that you did not provide to the people. Um, but again, elected officials don't need a pension. They don't need all these perks that are costing the state a lot of money and thus the taxpayer a lot of money. Well, believe it or not, we're almost run, uh, short out of time here. Uh, I'd like to give you a minute of opportunity to tell people how they can reach you if they want to support your campaign. How do they do it? Well, the easiest way is to come on to uh, www.electshondowning.com. Um, all the information, contact details are there. Donation page is there. They can find me on Facebook. Um, I'm always accessible. I tend to take my, you know, my phone numbers up there. If you want to call me directly, I'll be the guy who answers the phone. And uh, Raphael, for all those uh, voters out there that want to get information about the candidates that are out there, how do they reach your, your website and get a hold of you? Um, yeah, well, I've been tracking elections on a website that I call Massachusetts Elections 2010. So if you just go to Massachusetts-election-2010.com, um, you know, I've been tracking as many races as I can get to. Uh, we're encouraging uh, candidates to uh, write in give their ideas to the people. You know, we try to cover a lot of these issues, the scandals that go on, the probation issue of these things. Um, and, you know, I'm hoping to make people as informed as possible. And there is a primary with your election, correct? Yes, there is a, another Republican running for the state Senate um, out of Newburyport, so there'll be a Republican primary on September 14th. And there's three Republicans, yourself? No, there's two Republicans running. And one, one Democrat. And one Democrat. Okay, great. I like to, uh, you know, I'm sorry that we ran out of time so quickly. A uh, half hour is never enough. I'd like to give you another <laughs> invitation to come on, maybe have a debate with against your opponents on the show. Thank um, you, and we look forward to that. Uh, I want to thank candidate for state senator Sean Donning. I'd like to thank Rafael Batista from Massachusetts Election 2010. I am your host, Hector Montalvo. Thank you for watching Behind the Scenes. Watch us next time when we go behind the scenes to ask the tough questions, bring you their responses, and we let you decide. Thank you for watching.